Yusuf received his vacation to be her spouse and the guardian of the Redeemer. With them, let us treasure Christ's birth in our hearts and respond with complete love. Please stand and join in the entrance hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My dear brothers and sisters, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, on this last week before the great day of our Lord's coming, let us call to mind our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. pray. Pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ, your Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the, un in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Ahaz and said, Ask the Lord your God for a sign for yourself, coming either from the depths of Sheol or from the heights above. No, Ahaz answered, I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Listen now, house of David. Are you not satisfied with trying the patience of men without trying the patience of my God too? The Lord himself, therefore, will give you a sign. It is this. The maiden is with child and will soon give birth to a son. 
whom she will call Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. From Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, who has been called to be an apostle and specially chosen to preach the good news that God promised long ago through his prophets in the scriptures. This news is about the Son of God, who, according to the human nature he took, was a descendant of David. It is about Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in, in the order of the Spirit, the Spirit of holiness that was in him, was proclaimed the Son of God in all his power through his resurrection through the dead. Through him we received grace and our apostolic mission to preach the obedience of faith to all pagan nations in honour of his name. You are one of these nations, and by his call, belong to Jesus Christ. To you all, then, who are God's beloved in Rome, call to be saints. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ send grace and peace. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. A virgin will give birth to her son. His name will be Emmanuel, God is with us. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Saint Matthew. 
This is how Jesus Christ came to be born. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. But before they came to live together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a man of honour and wanting to spare her publicity, decided to divorce her informally. He had made up his mind to do this when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because she, was, she has conceived what is in her by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you must name him Jesus, because he is the one who is to save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill the words spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had told him to do. He took his wife to his home. The Gospel of the Lord. In this, in this fourth Sunday of Advent in year A, dear friends, we move to the Annunciation Gospel of the birth of Jesus Christ and his virginal conception. Matthew mentions this virginal conception took place when his mother Mary had been betrothed, but before Joseph and her had come together. What does that precisely mean? Matthew is referring, dear friends, to the ancient Jewish practice of a two-stage marriage process. A man and a woman would become legally married through an act of betrothal. We often think this means that Mary and Joseph were engaged, but it doesn't. Right? Betrothal was legal entry into a covenant marriage. Once a person was betrothed to someone else, they were husband and wife. They didn't consummate the marriage, however, until the two of them moved in with the other. And it was customary that after the betrothal, the bridegroom would go and prepare a house in order to be able to bring his bride into his home. Then what we would call the wedding ceremony would actually take place over the course of seven days. And it would culminate in the procession of the bride into the home of the bridegroom. And then the marriage would be consummated. Right? So the context of our, of our gospel, dear friends, is of Mary and Joseph being married, but not yet living together, not having celebrated the final wedding ceremony. That is why, dear friends, when Mary becomes pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit, Joseph is alarmed and perplexed about what to do because he has not yet taken Mary into his home. More than any emphasis on a supposed scandal, and it's interesting, dear friends, all right, more than any emphasis on a supposed scandal, what this delicate context shows, right, what this delicate context shows is that there could have been no scandal between Mary and Joseph. That's the point. Jesus is often referred to as the son of Joseph. And what this gospel is showing us is that this is far from the case apart from by means of adoption. Far from any emphasis on any supposed sexual scandal, here it's a notification, dear friends, of St. Joseph's non-involvement with the virginal conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when St. Joseph decides to send her away quietly, the angel appears to him and says, don't be afraid. It's interesting, he doesn't say, don't be scandalized, don't be angry, right? If, G if Joseph really was suspicious of Our Lady and her motives and her actions, you would think that would be his emotion. Don't be angry, calm down, all right? Just do what I tell you. No, don't be afraid. And you're afraid, dear friends, in front of a mystery that is more, that is overwhelming to you. That's when you are afraid. 
That's when you are afraid. When you are involved in something that you feel that you are not able to handle. A mystery too big. And you, it's not your proper context for you to be there. It's dangerous for you to be there. Do not be afraid all right, to take Mary as your wife. Take her into your home. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Another clear statement of the virginal conception. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In the original Aramaic, dear friends, the name for Jesus, Yeshua, means the Lord saves. That's what the name itself means. So there's a kind of a pun in the angel's proclamation. She will call his name the Lord saves because he will save his people from their sins. So we are getting both a revelation of the virginal conception of Jesus and the meaning of his name, revealing his identity, who he is, this son of Mary, the saviour. Matthew highlights, dear friends, that the unprecedented, miracle, the unprecedented miracle of the virginal conception of Jesus in, is in, in fact a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He goes back to our first reading, to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, one of the most controversial and debated passages in the Old Testament, by the way, one of the most debated of uh, Old Testament passages. The prophecy of a virgin who shall conceive and bear a son, and whose name shall be called, called Emmanuel, which means God with us. There again, we see the importance of a name. Who is this? Now, in terms of the context of this prophecy of Isaiah, dear friends, it's important to know a few details. The northern tribes, when this prophecy is delivered, right, the northern ten tribes of Israel that are often called Ephraim, or Israel, have teamed up with the pagan nation, empire of Syria. And they are threatening to attack the southern kingdom of Judah, the true, the true kingdom that stayed faithful to the Lord's temple worship. The king at this time in the southern kingdom of Judah is King Ahaz, and he's in a state of fear and trepidation. He's in danger about what to do in the face of his crisis and so the prophet Isaiah, who was living in the 8th century, right, 700 years before Christ, at the time of King Ahaz, he goes to the king to bring him a message of encouragement from the Lord himself. And in the midst of this message of encouragement, Isaiah gives this mysterious oracle that we've just heard. A virgin will conceive and bear a son. So Isaiah is telling, dear, telling at King Ahaz, dear friends, first and foremost, something awesome. Like imagine if this option was offered to you. Listen to these words. You can ask for a miracle, a sign to give you confidence and trust in the Lord, helping you to follow through and act on his advice. And it doesn't matter how big the miracle is, as high as heaven or as deep as Sheol, and the Lord is going to give it to you. It's the ultimate genie moment, right? To grant us anything we want. Except this, is, this, this, this wish fulfillment is real. And from the only truly all-powerful being in existence. Now Ahaz, what does he do? In a false kind of humility, piously rails, I don't want to put the Lord my God to the test, right? And God is angry with him for his false appropriation and abuse of scripture and his evident refusal of a faith that is demanding under these current circumstances. So Isaiah responds, to the vo responds as the voice of God and he says, well, if you're going to try God, let alone try the people around you, I'm going to make a prophecy for you anyway. I'm going to show you a sign. The Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. This is an extremely controversial verse, dear friends, because the Hebrew word that many translate as the word virgin is alma. And in many contexts, it's simply translated as young woman. So scholars have debated about this prophecy, right? Whether it means a virgin, a woman that hasn't had marital relations, 
or it's just a generic reference to a young woman, right? Is the emphasis here on her age or on her virginity? And this debate is kind of unfortunate and unnecessary. Why? Because English actually has a virtually exact word-for-word -word, um, translation for Hebrew. The word maiden. Have you guys ever heard that word before? All right, maiden. We know what it means, right? It's a young woman who is not married. It is a young woman who is not married and has had no marital relations. So it's not a matter of either or, it's a matter of both and. She's both young and a virgin. So there's an emphasis again here on her virginity, yet she bears a son that she's going to call Emmanuel, God with us. Now there are some reasons to think that on one level, dear friends, this prophecy initially uh, is initially fulfilled in Ahaz's son, right? That he's referring to one of his brides, Ahaz's brides, who, who brings forth his son, King Hezekiah, and he was born during those times where the crisis with Syria and Ephraim comes to an end, as the Lord delivers his people. But there are other elements, dear friends, of Isaiah's, Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 7, 8, and 9 that describe a child who's going to go well beyond what King Hezekiah ever was. Unto us a son is born, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God, and Prince of Peace. There is a development, dear friends, of this great king who will be so great that he will be called God and Everlasting Father. And the, and the prophecy, dear friends, only has its ultimate fulfillment, its full fulfillment in Jesus. So Matthew, in our passage, is in precisely interpreting Isaiah chapter 7 as truly fulfilled in this event that we're witnessing now. The virginal birth of Jesus, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit and who is in fact, it's not just called, but he is in fact God with us. Well, why, dear friends, what's the big emphasis on this virginal conception? Why couldn't Jesus have been born of the natural union of a man and a woman? Well, the catechism helps us to understand five reasons. First of all, the virginal conception shows us the birth of Jesus was a divine work. It wasn't a natural act that surpasses all human understanding. And this is really important. Dear friends, this is not only a miracle, but it is a mystery that we cannot fully grasp. How is it that the God of the universe could become man? How is it? How could we, with our limited minds, ever grasp such a mystery, such an act of love? Secondly, the virginal conception was the fulfillment of a prophecy, of the divine promise given through Isaiah. Now, although scholars may continue to debate how exactly to interpret this passage. Yeah, and remember, you have Jewish scholars, you have Protestant scholars, you've got all kinds of secular scholars, right? So obviously, if, if they really believed this, they'd become Christian. So if you, <laughs> there's going to be debate. But based on the Gospel of Matthew, the church very clearly interprets this prophecy precisely as what it claims to be, a virginal conception. Both of these two previous purposes only perform their function if the virginal conception of Jesus was actually historical, not just mythology. It's not a legend, it's not a folk tale to reveal deeper meaning. From its earliest beginnings, the church has been emphatic that the virginal conception of Jesus was a miracle and that it happened literally at a real moment in history. Fourthly, this teaching of Matthew, Isaiah and the church is one, dear friends, that demands a relationship of us and it demands a precise relationship with the Lord. It demands that believers be open to the infinite possibilities of God. It's not easier for us now than it was for the early Christians. It's the same demand in every generation. Do you believe God or not? Fifthly, the deepest reason for God uh, the reason of God for this mystery is that the virginal conception of Christ, dear friends, is one of the ways God reveals to us the mystery that Jesus Christ is not merely human and he's not merely divine. 
He's true God and true man, fully human, fully divine. The virginal conception reveals that Jesus has only God as his father in his divine nature, and he is the natural, he is the natural, not the adopted son of God, the natural son of God. At the same time, the virginal conception tells that tells us he's born of a woman, the Virgin Mary. So he is naturally the son of his mother in his human nature. And so, see, dear friends, we see here the divine and the human have become wedded. Heaven and earth have, have come together in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary so that humanity might be redeemed through Christ and might be invited to share in his divine life and his divine sonship. Him by nature, we by adoption. That is the good news of Christmas, dear friends. It's the full significance of it. That in the conception of Jesus, God isn't just with us in spirit. He isn't just with us symbolically being on our side. He is in fact Emmanuel. God with us in the flesh. And unlike King Ahaz, dear friends... In our deepest, darkest moments, in the midst of our biggest dangers and fears, we should look to this sign, this miracle that God prophesied and carried out precisely to give us the greatest confidence to trust him and to follow his advice because he has shown us in this miracle that he is all in and he is good for it. He knows what he's talking about and he delivers fully on his promises. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, let us stand and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear friends, Christmas is near. Let us pray to the Lord with hope and trust. That the church will faithfully carry out God's holy will in everything. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That our nation will seek out the only Saviour and bow before him. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That young men will listen to and answer Christ's call to the priesthood. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That our sick, suffering and lonely parishioners and loved ones will be comforted and strengthened by our Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That the souls of the faithful departed especially our parishioners and loved ones, will be granted eternal life. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer.
Come, Lord Jesus, in the power of your love, come and save us, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Holy Spirit, O Lord, sanctify these gifts laid upon your altar, just as he filled with his power the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray the second preface of Advent and the second Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For all the oracles of the prophets foretold him. The Virgin Mother longed for him with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sang of his coming and proclaimed his presence when he came. It is by his gift that already we rejoice at the mystery of his nativity, so that he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in praise. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, 
he took bread, and giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. For by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Vincent, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be free from sin and and always safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Thank you for your great patience, dear friends, and your prayerful participation. It's lovely to have um, so many beautiful souls all here focused on the worship of the good Lord and love of him and growing, uh, growing in holiness. Uh, just a few notices to bring to your attention, dear friends. Um, uh, so there's a special acknowledgement and, and thank you to Maureen McDonald um, uh, for her volunteering for the last 34 year, 35 years. God bless you wherever you are, Maureen. I don't know if you're here tonight or today. God bless you. Um, but uh, also uh, there's a few volunteers still, um, s- still uh, possibly needed, dear friends, for the church cleaning roster. Um, we also, for those of you who knew one of our long-time parishioners, Jeanette McHugh, um, originally Jeanette Galeozzo, um, she passed away recently and her funeral will be on Thursday the 29th after, after Christmas. Um, last holy hour for this year will be on the Thursday 22nd of December. No all-night adoration for January. Um, parish office being closed. There was something else I needed to bring to your attention. Oh yes, mass times for Christmas. Okay, normally each year, Christmas mass times are, um, they're slightly different from your Sunday mass times. Um, they would normally be 7.30 p.m. For the, for the family vigil mass, midnight, and then you'd have, what, a 8 a.m. and a 9.30. Um, well, because Christmas this year falls on Sunday, dear friends, you'd have people who would normally come for Sunday mass and we'd, they'd, they'd have all the masses out of place. So we're having Christmas masses at the normal Sunday mass times. Okay, so the family vigil mass will be at 6 p.m., midnight mass. Then there'll be an 8 a.m. Uh, Christmas morning mass and a 10 a.m. Christmas morning mass, okay? I know it might be a little bit eating into your Christmas lunch preparation, but anyway, just consistency for Sundays, huh? So please keep an eye out on the, the Christmas mass times and the New Year's mass, uh, the New Year's Eve mass times as well um, so, so that we can have the Lord flooding through through our, our, our new year and our, our Christmas celebrations as the Lord comes to us once more. Dear friends, please stand and let us pray. Having received this pledge of eternal redemption, we pray, Almighty God, that as the feast day of our salvation draws ever nearer, so we may press forward all the more eagerly to the worthy celebration of the mystery of your son's nativity, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, proclaiming the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.